moment, you must develop a personal work with him. It's crucial in discipleship. Are you getting me? Is that okay, please? A situation in which you have a discipler, but you cannot discern the will of God so that a discipler will only confirm it. You have missed the first crucial thing already. You must personally work with Jesus. I'm emphasizing this because it's a great omission that many young people miss. You must work with Jesus day after day. And when I say work with Jesus, I told you you must always be in his presence listening to him. And that also means you must be in contact with him in the Bible, in studying your Bible personally. Do you know the language of the Holy Spirit is the scriptures? It doesn't have any other word to use. The scriptures is his word, is his language. And in John 16, the Bible tells us that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will take of what is mine and show it to you. He will not speak of his own accord. He will speak to you what I have said to him. So, God's word is the Holy Spirit's language. Study the word of God. Your personal work with God will be empty without your personal study of God's word. Be a Bible student. That's how nobody can cheat you out of the scriptures and teach you error. You know there are many errors in our time. Many errors that if a man of God should tell you, you are going to pass your exam, hallelujah. You are going to pass your exam. But I'm the one to make a way for you. God has told me I'm the one to make a way for you. And he says, you must come to the church office at 7 p.m. I will make a way for you. Do you know there are ladies, Christians, born again, who will run after that man of God and go there at 7 p.m. And you queue, you line up. And is messing up with you in the office one after the other. Trying to make a way for you. Because you don't know the scriptures. Where did you find Jesus doing that in the Bible? You must study scriptures so that you don't fall into the errors of our time. Men of God, so called, they have, they have, they have specialized in coining certain things, errors, that if you don't know the original, you will not be able to detect the fake. Do you know when you get to the bank, there is a way that you detect fake, fake currency. Those bankers, you don't need to teach them. They know the one that is fake. Why? Because they first took time to study the original. Am I right? They have all the features of the original currency. They, they study it. They know it. So immediately you bring the fake. Mm. They say, this is a fake currency. Then they take it to their light. And then they confirm that it's fake. If you want to be able to detect error, you must be versatile in your knowledge of the word of God. So that if anybody comes saying some things, false doctrine, errors, you'll be able to say, mm, that's rubbish. That is not in the Bible. And you walk away. Nobody must compel you to follow such a junk and swallow it. Are you getting me this morning? I'm challenging you to a personal, a personal study of the word of God. This is crucial for every disciple. I don't know how it happens to people who gave their lives to Christ nowadays. When I gave my life to Christ, honestly, because I was very religious before, as an Anglican, I was religious. And we read Bible. I belong to the Anglican Youth Fellowship. We do all those things. But I was not born again. So when I gave my life to Christ, the word of God I heard, I wondered, I said, you mean this thing has been in the Bible and me, I didn't know it. That created one hunger in my heart for the word of God. 
and I was reading medicine, you know. I was in my first year in medical school when I gave my life to Christ. That hunger made me to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in three months. Three months! I finished it. I started with the book of Matthew. And everywhere I went, a Bible was in my bag. If the lecturer delays, I read my Bible. I, I was just hungry, at least for that time. I was very hungry. When I finished from Matthew to Revelation, I now started with Genesis. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter... I was just devouring it, eating it. And as I finished everything, I started again. And I tell you, this is more than 30 years. The Bible is not outdated. It's sweeter every day. I read it every day. Even this morning, I read it. And God spoke to me from my own quiet time. How will you be able to detect error? When you are not knowledgeable in the word of God. You will become, you will just continue to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And you will never grow. You won't enter into your inheritance. So in working with God, your personal Bible study is very crucial. Apart from going for Bible study with other believers, your own personal Bible study is very important. And as you study, as God speaks to you, obey. That's how it will be yours. I know we have had that in the morning, during the morning challenge. Obedience. Obedience to whatever God says to you from the scriptures is what actually cements your work with God. When you just study the Bible and you don't obey, you are just deceiving yourself. You are not really working with God. You are only doing Bible knowledge or religious knowledge. It won't profit you. In fact, the letter kills. It will kill you. It will damage you a little more. If you just read and you don't obey. Are you getting me this morning? So in, in working with God, your prayer life, very crucial. Your personal Bible study, very important. And your obedience to the word of God marks and makes the difference when you walk with God. God speaks to you. He instructs you. And your life changes. You are walking with him. And make it progressive. Tomorrow also, seek instruction from him. And follow and obey. That's how to follow Jesus. That's how to follow Jesus personally. So, discipleship involves personal work with God consistently. As you hear the Lord teaching and instructing you from his word by the Holy Spirit, discipleship involves taking practical steps to obey him. If you continue to obey him, then you are his disciples indeed. Even if a disciple stops following the Lord, you can continue because you have the personal work with the Lord. You remember Samuel. Do you remember Samuel in the Bible? Who was the disciple of Samuel? Eli. Eli. Do you know he was under Eli? He learned priesthood from Eli. He learned how to work with God and do, you know, ministry under Eli. And his mother also was visiting him every year contributing but you see Eli and his sons especially his sons who were the senior pastors in the temple in those days in Shiloh senior pastors they were children of Belial the Bible says they love meat too much when people bring offering they will put flesh hook and say give it to me now raw it must not be cooked and they will put their fork. And whatever the fork brings out, that will be the priest own. They love meat. They love offering too much. And they, they despise the offerings of the Lord. And not only that, they were sexually immoral. The Bible says they used to lie with women at the door of the temple. Can you imagine that rubbish? 
They won't even go home to do it. They do it right at the temple door. But it was in the same environment that, he, that Samuel grew and yet he was not contaminated. How was he able to make it? He had a personal work with God. Your personal work with God will deliver you even if your disciple misses the road. Of course, the Bible tells us to follow a disciple, follow a leader, only as he follows Jesus. When he, when he deviates, you must follow on. But how will you be able to know that he has deviated if you are not following Jesus? Are you getting me this morning? Follow Jesus. Work with him personally. Moment by moment, don't let a disciple be the one to push you to be having your quiet time. You have your quiet time. Don't be a wheelbarrow Christian. You know a wheelbarrow. If you put a wheelbarrow here, it will be here till tomorrow. If you want a wheelbarrow to move, what must you do, please? You push it. Don't be pushed before you work with God. Don't have to be pushed before you have your quiet time. Don't have to be pushed before you go in obedience to God when he sends you to do something. Don't be a wheelbarrow Christian. In fact, let me tell you the truth. A disciple who has no personal work with God is the hardest person to disciple. A disciple will suffer to disciple a wheelbarrow Christian. You must have a locomotive inside of you. The engine of the Holy Spirit and of the word of God moving you in such a way that nobody needs to push you before you work with God. So, a personal work with God makes your progress fast in discipleship. You will be easy to disciple. In fact, the discipler will be able to guide you fast and you will enter into your inheritance in good time. May God give you understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. You know that was the kind of thing that happened to Joseph in the Bible. That man had a personal work with God. When he was at home, it was his father that was discipling him. He was, he was under his father. He was close to his father. Of course, we understand that because he was the firstborn of the darling of his father, Rachel. So when Rachel died, he became the darling of the father. He, in fact, Jacob bought him a coat of many colors. So he was intimate with Jacob. Jacob told him stories about his own work with God. He feared God, you know, by his relationship with Jacob, his father, who has now become a spiritual man. So much that he began to dream about the future that God had for him. He dreamt great dreams. I know you know those dreams. Can I assume that you know them? Great dreams about the great future ahead of him. Because he was also now able to walk with God. But you see, it's unfortunate that many of you, when you will dream, what do you dream about? You dream about a man coming to sleep with you. You dream about uh, masturbation. You dream, you see water spirits coming to harass you. Do you know why you are dreaming such dreams? You are not walking with God. You don't know the victory that Jesus wrought for you at the cross. So the devil can exploit you. When Joseph was dreaming, he wasn't dreaming of those useless things. Wrong things. Rotten dreams. No. He was dreaming great dreams about the future. A walk with God is very crucial. And when he left the presence of his father, as his father sent him and he went in obedience, what happened? Even there far away in Egypt, when he was sold as a slave, he was still working with God. God also was working with him. If you read the story of Joseph, I don't have time this morning. God worked with him. He worked with God. So much that when Pharaoh's uh, Potiphar's wife said, lie with me. What did he say? He said, how can I sin against God? 
and against my master. Which means he was there as a slave, but in the presence of God. He was, the presence of God went with him into Potiphar's house. He was always conscious of God's presence with him. And he would not sin against God. You must walk with God as a disciple. You can't leave that and say you are doing discipleship. There will be no discipleship without a walk with God. Abraham also walked with God and he entered into God's purpose. Daniel, Mary of Bethany, all of them walked with Jesus. And you can see how great God made their lives. We have heard some of their stories even this morning. You must walk with God. What is the other, other uh, matter that we must look at in discipleship? The other characteristic of discipleship that you must engage in if you will be a disciple indeed, following Jesus. Apart from your personal walk with God, you must pattern your life after Christ. Tell somebody beside you, pattern your life after Christ. Christ is the is the pattern son. He is the one that God introduced to us as his son in whom he is well pleased. Just as Adam was to have children in his image, even after the fall, we are told, Adam began to have children in his likeness and after his image. That's God's order. That's how it is. In the same way, Jesus, the second Adam, was to also have children, spiritual children, in his own image. And so Romans chapter 8 verse 29 tells us, because we must resemble somebody, just as we resemble the first Adam by our natural birth, now that the natural birth has gone by our new birth experience, we must resemble Jesus. Romans 8 29. Romans 8 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God is saying, You that God foreknew, you that God has called, you that God has saved. You must become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, his son. So that Jesus will not be the only son of God. But he will be the first among what? Many brethren. You will be a brother of Jesus. But to be a brother of Jesus, you must resemble him. You must be like him. If you are truly born again, his life is in you. The seed of God is in you. The nature of Christ is in you. You must now live that life and grow in Christ. Grow to become like Jesus. You must resemble Christ. God introduced Jesus. In Matthew chapter, chapter 3 verse 17. When Jesus was to be baptized, a voice came all the way from heaven to introduce Christ. And what did that voice, uh, voice say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And God stopped there. Because even for Jesus, God was watching him to see how he would behave. Character wise, he was so humble. He was, he had already, you know, become, he had proved the life of God in him. He had been discipled up to this point under his parents. For 30 years he was there learning godliness and, you know, worshipping with them. Learning under the law. Obedient to them. Submissive to them. The Bible said they, he followed them back to Nazareth. And he was subject to them. Discipleship. And having proved that, 
when he now humbled himself and came to, to be baptized by the man he created, John the Baptist. That was humility number one. God spoke from heaven and said, wow, you have done this? He introduced him and said, I am completely satisfied with this one. Now as he continued working with God in obedience, by the time we reach Matthew chapter 17 verse 5, Again, a voice came from, the, from heaven to introduce Christ to the entire world. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. God never, never introduced any other man to us. Whether in the Bible or in any time. It's only Jesus that God has introduced to us. Even Moses, as great as he was, David, as great as they were, God never introduced them and said, this is my beloved son. I am well pleased with him. Listen to him. Or did you see anybody in the Bible like that? No, no one. Only Jesus has been certified to have been approved of God and God commanded, listen to him. He is the pattern. He is the pattern for us to follow. Every other man, whether in the Bible or in our contemporary times, they are all awaiting results. Do you know awaiting results? Somebody who has uh, maybe done exam and has not yet got the result and is applying for admission. What do you write in that jam form? Awaiting results. If you follow a waiting result, you don't know what that result will be after all. If the result comes and it fails, what happens to you that follows that person? You will fail. That's why we cannot follow any, any man who is not following Jesus. Are you getting me? You know, Paul knew this. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, follow me as I do what? As I follow Christ. If you see me deviate from Christ, don't follow me. You will only follow a man as long as he follows Jesus. So you must first remember that Jesus is the pattern son. If you will be pleased with God, if God will be pleased with you, you must follow Jesus. If he will also say, this is my beloved daughter. I am well pleased with him. It must be that your life has become conformed to the image of his son. He is the pattern son. He is the one that God is completely satisfied with. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 tells us, again, God introducing Jesus. He said, look, in time past, God used to speak to our fathers by the prophets. Prophets will come and prophesy. To them. And that's how they, they will hear God. But in these last days, he is speaking to us. By who? By his son Jesus. Who, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Jesus, who is the brightness of his glory. The express image of his person. If you follow Jesus and pattern your life after him, you will never be lost. Are you getting me? All others, including our pastors, including our bishops, including our disciples, everyone is awaiting. Help me end it now. Awaiting what? <laughs> Everybody is awaiting results. Only Jesus has got his result. And what is the result? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God has given him approval. He is the one that is not awaiting results. He has got his own results. So the Bible says follow him. Listen to him. That's why in Luke 9 that we read the other day, verse 23, from the Amplified Version, the last part of it that says follow me. Jesus meant Cleave steadfastly to me. 
conform wholly to my example in living and if need be in dying also. So pattern your life after Christ. Pattern your life after him and you will not miss it at all. If you will follow Moses, for example, Moses in the Bible, he was a man of God, isn't it? Great man of God. In fact, the Bible says he was the meekest of all men. But do you know, if you follow Moses, by the time you follow him, you should follow him eh, in his meekness, in his you know, ability to follow God. Follow him. But when you get to one aspect of his character, don't follow him. What is that aspect? His anger. If you follow him in that aspect and say, even Moses was angry, I must be angry now and deal with all of you. Ah, you also, you know Moses, because of his anger, didn't enter the land of promise. You also will not enter. So as you follow Moses, follow him only as long as you see him resemble Christ. When you get to his anger, you follow Jesus. Are you getting me? If you are following David and you are studying David in the Bible, oh, David, the Bible says he was a man after God's heart. And we like, oh, we like that. You forgot that it was before he married, he was a man after God's heart. That was when God testified of him. It's good to follow David. His courage, his boldness, his humility, oh, when he was confronted with his sin, he confessed, he broke down, he wept. Very humble. But, as you follow David, you follow David, David, the great psalmist of Israel, and you get to his marriage life. Don't follow David. Though. Some people say, ah, ah, David was a man after God's heart and he married many wives. Why can't we marry many wives? Ha! Ah, be very careful. Because if you do, if you follow him into that marriage pattern, the trouble he had is in his marriage will also follow you. Do you know the trouble he had in his marriage? May you not have it in Jesus' name. So you will only follow a man as long as he follows Jesus. We are going to still talk about working with disciples. But I must emphasize the fact that your personal work with God, patterning your life after Christ's own, is very crucial. Which means you must study how Jesus lived so that you can pattern your life after his own. May God give you understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. The next characteristic of discipleship relationship that must be evident in your life if you are a true disciple is that you must have tutors, guidance under whom to grow. Apart from having a vibrant personal work with God and patterning your life after Christ, there must be guardians, tutors under whom you are growing. At any point in time, there must be one. There must be somebody. And if God wills that at another stage of your life, he wants to raise another person, there must be a guardian. There must be a tutor over your life. Galatians chapter 4. We have read it before. Maybe I just quickly read it again. Verses 1 and 2. Galatians chapter 4. 1 and 2. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. God puts his disciples under tutors, under guardians, under governors, until the time appointed by the Father. There must be some matured people under whom you are growing. Otherwise, your discipleship experience will not balance. Let me give you an example. You know Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Do you remember Saul? Please answer me so that we move fast. All right. 
if you go to Acts chapter 9, where he was converted, you will see how God, in his own way, appointed guardians, tutors, right immediately to help his life on his journey. As soon as he fell, when the Lord encountered him, and the Lord rebuked him and said, it is hard for you to kick against the bricks. The next thing he said is, Lord, what do you want me to do? Absolute surrender. What now? What should I do? And what did the Lord say to him? He said, arise. Go into the city and you will be told what you must do. As a disciple of Christ, be ready to be told what to do. Be humble enough to be told. Was it uh, Prophet David yesterday in that drama? Who will not want anybody to tell him what to do? You know the end of the story for his life. You must be humble enough to be instructed. Even when Paul had become a great apostle who was doing great miracles, that thing didn't leave him. He still wanted to be taught. So he carried the messages he has been preaching. And he went to Jerusalem to submit it to Peter. And said, please check me. I don't know whether I'm correct, what I'm preaching. So that I will, I will not be an error preacher. He was still humble enough to learn, even from such a great height. He was still teachable. The Bible says, Jesus told him, right from this beginning, you will be told what you must do. And I wondered, I said, ah, Lord Jesus, somebody is asking you, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, why can't you just, just tell him? I don't know whether you are thinking like me. You know, I, I thought God should have told him, yes, I'm going to tell you now what you must do. You are going to suffer for me. You are going to preach the gospel both to the Jews and the Gentiles. As you are rising now, you must begin to preach for me. Do you know Jesus didn't tell him anything like that? Jesus said, it will be told you what you must do. That's the work of a disciple. When Jesus said, you will be told. Now see what he went quickly to go and do. Jesus now went and appeared to one of his disciples, Ananias. And told Ananias, arise, verse 11. Go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Ah, Ananias was saying, ah, God, Lord, don't send me. Oh. Ah, that man is a persecutor. And the Lord said, no, I have done something to him. Go your way, for he's a chosen vessel of mine, verse 15, to bear my name before the Gentiles, before kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Can you see a drama there? What Jesus could have directly told Paul, whom is he telling now? And are you following at all? Whom was he telling now? Ananias. Why couldn't he tell Paul? No, God follows his order. He doesn't confuse things. He puts his children under tutors and governors. And he puts their bread... The bread for his son, his child, his daughter. He puts it in the hand of a tutor. He won't tell the, the, the child directly. So that the child will learn obedience. One thing that God wants to achieve with each of you in discipleship. Is to develop a life of obedience. And God will make sure he puts something in the hands of your disciple for you. And if you say no. I'm going to fast. God will reveal it to me what he wants me to do. Now lie. He won't tell you. He will say it will be told you. And you go ahead and tell your disciple. You pray from today to tomorrow. He won't show you that thing. 
so that you will learn how to submit to instructions and obey the people that he sends to you. So now, he went and told Ananias the future of Saul. Are you getting me this morning? So when Ananias got there, he simply prayed for Saul and told him what he must do as the Lord has promised Saul. You will be, you, he said, you are going to suffer many things by the hands of people and you are going to bear the Lord's name before Gentiles, before kings and before the children of Israel. He told him. And then the Lord told Ananias, see the, the matter in verse 16. Everybody look at verse 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. What is God doing there again? God is now again telling Ananias that even you, I won't give you everything pertaining to this young man. I'm going to still show him something which I didn't show you. So, if Saul will not walk with God, will he be able to fulfill verse 16? No. Because God wants to show him something directly. But he won't show him everything. He will go and show his disciples some and show him some. So if you don't submit to disciples a great junk of your, your instruction will miss you. You will roam around. You won't jam it because you have forsaken the grace that could have been yours. Disciples are tutors. They are guardians made by God to guide us into our inheritance and God deliberately put our bread in their hands. Every disciple must submit under tutors. Otherwise, you, there is no way you will enter into the inheritance of your father. The fourth matter that characterizes discipleship that we are looking at is that discipleship does not only involve your personal work with God, patterning your life after Christ, and submitting under disciples. It also involves horizontal relationship with fellow believers. Discipleship is not only vertical relationship with a disciple and with God. It also involves horizontal relationship with other believers. Other believers are also contributing to your discipleship. So it involves submitting yourself to other believers and being in good relationship with them. Have a healthy relationship with other believers. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13 tells us that we are members of one body. Members of the body of Christ. We are parts of his body. Some people are the eyes. Some are the hands. As an illustration. Some are the legs. Some are the nose. The ears. Suppose your disciple is, is a leg in the body of Christ. And maybe you, you are the hand. There are other believers who are the eyes. Are you getting my illustration this morning? Now, suppose you submit to your disciple who is the leg. And you say, I don't listen to anybody. My, what my disciple tells me, that's what I will listen to. All of you keep quiet. I don't care who is offended. Do you remember David yesterday? Prophet David. I don't care. God has forgiven me and that is it. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. He missed it. So if you submit to your disciple, who is the leg, and other disciples that are the eyes, you say, I don't care. Do you know a leg without an eye? What will happen to that leg? We soon fall into the ditch and break the bones. You need to submit to other members of the body of Christ so that your growth in discipleship will be robust. Because God has put something in them for you. 
just as God has put the ability to see in the eyes for the leg and for the hands. If you don't submit to other believers and relate well with you and they don't contribute that, no discipler has everything that it takes to make you become like Jesus. At best, a discipler is only a part of the body of Christ. Did you hear me? No discipler, as important as disciples are, as I have told you, no discipler has everything it takes to make you to be like Jesus. He has his share and a major share of overseeing your life and giving you the bread that is meat for you in due season. But that is all. There are other things that other people must contribute. So, if you are just working your own way and relating only with your disciple, you will make a lot of mistakes in life. So, nurture a vibrant relationship with other disciples. A disciple who is having grudges against others and he says, so long as I'm in good fellowship with God and with my disciple, I'm okay. You are not okay. You cannot be a good child of God and a bad sister to your brother. You are a bad child of God. Our relationship vertically as well as horizontally must be vibrant so that others can contribute what God has put in them into our lives. That's what all disciples did. You remember the disciples of Christ. Do you know that as they were relating with Christ, they were also relating with one another. Am I right? They were relating. Sometimes they will be talking and they don't want Jesus to hear. He said, what are you saying on the road? Good. That's good relationship. Sometimes one of them will misbehave and the others will be quarreling with, with him. And Jesus will tell them, he said, no. The, 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 the people of the Gentiles, they rule and lord over people. It must not be so among you. Yes. So discipleship relationship also involves horizontal fellowship, relating with other believers. Again, on this note, let me tell you that it's important that a disciple must belong to a fellowship, must belong to a church where he can relate with other believers. Don't say because you are in discipleship relationship, you no longer go to church. Brothers and sisters, that is unlike Christ. Do you know Jesus used to go to church? Hello? Do you know he never missed going to the synagogue for worship? In fact, the Bible says it was his custom. He made it a lifestyle. Make it a lifestyle to go to church and fellowship also with other believers. So that they can contribute to your life and you will contribute to their lives. Is that right, please? That will be correct discipleship. Now, looking at how God builds and establishes and equips his children for the future through discipleship. You know Moses' story? Looking at how God built Moses, his parents contributed. Particularly his mother. They built him. For three months, they were working on his life to preserve him, to bring him up, to keep him. And when they could no longer keep him, but the labor of his parents over his life has not yet finished. You know, sometimes there is danger. And uh, a disciple has to be moved somewhere else. Because of danger. But what this other person is doing in your life has not yet ended. You can't, you can't say that is all. After three months, they could no longer keep him. God now still arranged. He arranged that Pharaoh's daughter should, should pick him up. But when Pharaoh's daughter, who could not nurse a baby, realized that she could not nurse a baby, 
God, it was still God working. She asked Miriam to go and call someone. As Miriam said, can I go and call one of the Hebrew women? She said, yes, go. And when Miriam went, whom did she call? The mother. Because the labor of the parents over him has not yet finished. He still had to be under the parents until he grew to a certain extent. And if you read Exodus chapter 2, the Bible said, after he had grown, the mother took him to the palace and he became Pharaoh's daughter's son. Now, the first building, the laying of the foundation in our lives is the primary role of our parents. Foundation for life. Even if your parents are unbelievers, they have something to contribute. Respect them and submit to them. We had it yesterday in the seminar on relationship. Don't castigate your parents. They have something to contribute, which if you miss in the name of, I'm going for fellowship. Mom, I can't wash those plates. So. Me, I'm going for fellowship. Oh. Ah, you want me to backslide? I'm going for fellowship. Mommy said, wash the plates and you are escaping with fellowship. When you would have left home and mommy will no longer be calling you to wash plates, there will be an omission in your life. God kept Moses at home for that while so that the mother and father could do something. And you know, it was when he was under their care that the mother must have been drumming it into his ears. You are not Pharaoh's daughter's son. You are my son. You are an Israelite. And when, you, when I was giving birth to you, and I saw you as soon as you came out, I saw something about your future. You are going to deliver Israel from bondage in Egypt. You are a proper child. You are a special child. Please, you are not, you are not an Egyptian. You are, you are not Pharaoh's daughter's son. You are a Jew. That input stayed with him. He stayed with him. And as he was taken to the palace, even though at the palace, he was living the palace life, of course he needed that training so that he could strike Pharaoh in the future. He could be equipped to be able to strike Pharaoh. But he remembered the foundation laid that he was not an Egyptian. He was built at home. And then when he got to the palace, he was equipped. The Bible says he was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. He went to King's Comprehensive College, Egypt. Where King's children used to go. He went there. He was learned in all the philosophies of Egypt. So he was equipped with the arrows to shoot at Pharaoh tomorrow. Let me tell you that even your educational training is part of your discipleship. God is arming you for the future. He is giving you the ammunition for the future. Don't refuse it and say, Hey, people are dying. God has called me to be an evangelist. How can I stay here? Reading a Greek, a Greek for God's sake. Oh God, deliver me, deliver me. Ah, if God should deliver you from that university and you go and you say you are preaching about with, from, from five, from six uh, SSE certificate, God will still use you all. But you have already limited your horizon. You will be limited in your scope of operation. Your education is part of your discipleship. Face it. Face it. So that you can stand tall in the society tomorrow. And you will stand before kings and not before mere people. Face your education. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. That was how he, he was able to surmount the wisdom of Egypt. Even when he came back, he now had wisdom to crack Pharaoh and all Egypt. He had wisdom to face the enemy and deliver God's people. 
to face your education is an equipment for tomorrow. After 40 years, he felt, hi, it is enough. I cannot continue to be a liar. They, they are calling me Pharaoh's daughter's son. They call him Moses Pharaoh. But what was his real name supposed to be? Moses Amram. Ah, how can I be fake? How can my name be Moses Pharaoh? I'm not Moses' daughter's son. And so he, he made restitution. He confessed. I am not Pharaoh's daughter's son. And that meant he must now leave the palace. They drove him also to the field of affliction. He must go and join his people. And the Bible said he esteemed the, the reproach of Christ better riches than the dainties of Egypt. That's discipleship. He was working with God every moment. He will not be a liar. He restituted all his wrong past. And he didn't mind suffering. Our brother Tokwe was telling us in the uproar how he also had to stand for righteousness even if it meant suffering. That's a work with God. When he confessed that and he now knew that what God has called him to do was to deliver God's people from Egypt. He went to the field of affliction to start his ministry. He didn't know that before be, before starting anything, it must be made. It must be built. It must be discipled further. All the educational training, all the home training was now not enough. He needed another training for him to be able to lead the people of God. He needed to be equipped further and to be sent by God. He was called. He was not made. And he wanted to be sent. There was an omission. So when he got there and he saw two people fighting, an Egyptian fighting an Israelite, he killed the Egyptian thinking he had started his ministry. He wants to deliver Israel from the hand of Egypt. He killed the Egyptian. And then he was happy that day. He marched home majestically. Yes, hallelujah. God is using me. And the following day, he came back. He wanted to continue this ministry of killing Egyptians one by one. When he got there, he was surprised to see two Israelites fighting. He said, ah, ah, ah. God saved you today. I taught you an Egyptian. I would have taught you a lesson. Why are you fighting? You are brethren. And then they pushed him away. He said, who made you? Ah, who made you a ruler? And a judge over us. Who made you? Even though you are called, you have not been made. Who made you? By the way, who sent you to us? And he ran. And God guided him until he landed in the house of Jethro. He ran to Midian. Entered into the hand of Jethro. And Jethro was the priest of Midian. One of the descendants of Abraham. And there, Moses was further equipped. There, Moses learned priesthood, which he needed in the wilderness. There, Moses learned shepherding, because Jethro was a shepherd. Are you getting me? Some of you, what God has for you in the future, you need equipping. Some of the things you need, you don't have it yet in your character. And God needs to direct you to a discipler who will put that character in you. Don't dodge it. Jethro had six, seven daughters. They gave him one. And he was contented. He didn't sleep with any of the other six daughters. They gave him one. He stayed with that one. That was part of discipleship. He was contented. He learned contentment. He learned purity of life. In the palace in Egypt, he couldn't get that. Girls would be swarming around him like bees. But in discipleship, he learned purity. Do you know if it was Jacob that was staying in the midst of six girls? Ah! He 
will marry all of them. He will sleep with all of them. But Moses will not do that. He learned purity of life. He learned contentment. He learned godliness. He was satisfied with whatever was given him. He was equipped with character for the future life, for the future service.